Hello, my name is Christina Jimenez with the Jimenez Law Firm. And I'm Josh Floyd, also with the Jimenez Law Firm. And today we are going to talk to you all about temporary restraining orders. So anytime we file a civil suit, a family suit, if it's for a modification, if it's a divorce, if it's a SAPSR um, or a suit affecting parent-child relationship, a petition to adjudicate, um, basically any sort of family motion other than potentially a motion for enforcement, um, a lot of times in a lot of counties, you will see what we call a temporary restraining order. That will be one of the documents that you are served with. And I will tell you that um, I can't tell you the number of times that I have clients who call me and they're just in absolute panic because they've been served with a restraining order and they don't really fully understand what it means. Um, now, in some counties, they have implemented what we call standing orders. And so, Floyd, why don't you explain what that is? So standing orders are essentially a TRO, uh, temporary restraining order, sorry. Um, Basically, they, they mirror one another, but with a standing order, it's a document that all of the district judges have gotten together in the county and signed. Um, and so in those counties, you don't have to request a temporary restraining order unless you need something extraordinary, which we'll get to when we get into that port, part of it. But um, so it's just like a temporary restraining order. It's just one that's signed preemptively by the judges, attached to the petitions. And so you'll be served with that as well for the counties that, yeah, the counties that offer that. And so, you know, as he stated, it's they're very, very similar in um, in the actual substance of what it says and what it says that you can't do and can't do. Um, it's just something that will automatically be implemented and attached to your petition in those counties. But for the purposes of today's, you know, session, we're just going to walk you through what a TRO means and whether or not you should really be concerned about it or if it's just what we call a standard TRO. And throughout this video, we're going to be calling it a TRO. Um, and when we say that it is temporary restraining order. So what we have done is we have prepared a TRO that we will sometimes use in some of our different cases. And we want to kind of walk you through this and explain to you the, the highlights of it um, and some things that are often misinterpreted or that cause some of our clients a lot of concern. And so, um, Floyd, if you want to kind of give them the breakdown of these, um, of these, what these mean. Okay, yeah. So first of all, big picture, right? TRO, purpose of the TRO is to keep everything the same. Same with standing orders. The purpose is to keep everything the same until you get to a hearing, right? Um, and so generally speaking, like we're in this TRO, one through five um, are specific orders that protect the parties. Um, and then you'll see we go through it, six through 32. Those are orders that are specific to protect property. And then 33 through 37 are orders for the protection of the children. Um, and in this TRO, there's a couple of other things like the specific authorizations and the extraordinary relief, which we'll get into. But generally speaking, that's what it is. So I will tell you that most often, so here you'll see, just kind of walking through it, application of John Smith. So John Smith in this case was the petitioner and he is filing the case against his soon to be ex-wife, Jane Smith, and they have two kiddos, Joe and Jack, okay? And so in this case, um, it says that the court has examined the pleadings and the affidavit of the petitioner and finds that the petitioner is entitled to a TRO, okay? So depending on the case and depending on how um, extraordinary the circumstance may be, you may, your attorney may file an affidavit requesting things over and above what a general TRO is, okay? And that can include things like denying access and things of that nature, which we'll talk about further in the session. Um, but for most TROs, there's not going to be a supporting affidavit. It's going to be something that the family code allows us to implement um, automatically without any affidavits or any additional evidence. So the first five, um, or is it six? First five. As Floyd indicated, this is mostly pertaining to um, protecting the, the persons or the individual, okay? So whenever I'm explaining these TROs to my clients, I explain to them that 
listen, this is really just to prevent you from doing things that you probably would never even contemplate doing if you were not going through the process of a divorce. Because I think we all kind of understand that sometimes when you're going through this process, people sometimes get a little bit emotional and they do things that they probably would not do, okay? Um, so the biggest thing that I always hear from one to five um, is, well, now I can't talk to the other party or I can't talk to my kids because I have this TRO um, that has been served on me. And the bottom line is, is that's not accurate, right? Um, and so Floyd, if you wanna kind of explain what one through five actually mean. So, I think one is probably the one that's most misleading because um, most of the time they read that first sentence, right? It says that you're prohibited from or restrained from intentionally communicating with the petitioner, right? They don't read the last sentence that you just highlighted by use of vulgar, profane, obscene, or indecent language. So they immediately just think, I'm not allowed to talk to them. The truth is, is that you can, you just can't be rude, right? You can't curse them out um, or anything like that. Um, and number two, you just can't threaten them, right? Uh, number three, you, you can't harass them, right? Can't make calls in the middle of the night, call them over and over, things like that. Um, you can't cause them bodily injury, which you shouldn't do anyway, because that's against the law. And then number five, you can't threaten them. Um, and so those five are, are there just to protect the parties, but it doesn't prevent you from being able to talk or communicate or anything else with, in this case, your spouse. And so, you know, kind of a, an interesting um, takeaway, like Floyd said, you know, if obviously if you were to cause bodily injury to, um, if somebody was served with this document and then they decided that they were going to cause bodily injury, then obviously there would be some criminal consequences. But in addition to that, the, a very important factor about this is once you are served with this TRO, um, you can be held in contempt for violating these things. So not only could you have a civil, or excuse me, a criminal consequence, you could also have a civil um, or criminal contempt action that will be brought um, against you in this lawsuit. Um, so clearly these are things that you shouldn't be doing, okay? Now six through, I believe we said 32, yes. These all pertain to property, okay? And again, if you're operating under the normal philosophy of don't do things that you otherwise would not do, you're going to be okay. Okay. Um, so number six, it basically just states don't intentionally, knowingly, recklessly destroy, remove, conceal, encumber, or transfer any property that belongs to you guys. Okay. And you'll see as we're going through this, this is basically the overarching um theory of six through 32 is don't destroy it, don't sell it, don't, you know, transfer it over to your grandpa, um, don't remove it and hide it in storage, don't do anything that would otherwise prevent the other party or the court from finding out, you know, the value of the property or what it is or being able to somehow identify it so that it could be saved for further distribution. Right, Floyd? I agree. Okay, um, so a lot of these in this section also um, pertain to records, um, misrepresenting things. Um, so Floyd, why don't you speak on that? So starting with number seven, right? Um, that just says that you can't, you know, falsify any writings, right? You can't make up documents. Um, number eight just says you can't refuse to disclose the information to the court or to the party. Uh, you can't damage anything um, like any electronically stored stuff. And so the the big one, and I think it's covered in one of these, is the social media um, and text messages, right? So you can't you can't go delete text messages because they're bad for you. You can't take down um, social media posts and delete social media posts because you think it's going to adversely affect your case not once you're served with this TRO because then that's a violation of the TRO. Um, and so again, this just says, leave everything the way it is. Don't go messing with anything. So, you know, going to, to 12 and 13, this is always, um, and, and I guess 14 as well. 
Um, these are always concerns that I have um, or that my potential clients have when I'm dealing um, or doing constant consultations. So a lot of times they're like, well, you know, I would like to hire you, but I, you know, it says that I can't incur debt. So I don't want to put this on my credit card or it says that I can't withdraw money from my checking or savings account. Um, and so we will get to the exceptions here in just a little bit, but the TROs and most standing orders, they carve out exceptions to all of that. Okay. Um, and as a matter of fact, I'm just going to jump down to that really quickly so I can show you guys. Um, so we have here that you are uh, specifically authorized to make um, expenditures and incur indebtedness for reasonable and necessary living expenses, um, food, clothing, shelter, transportation, medical care, and acts that are um, reasonably necessary to conduct your normal business. In addition to that, it allows you or, or it permits you to... Um, to make expenditures for reasonable and necessary attorney's fees. And so you will never um, get in trouble from a court if you're incurring a debt or withdrawing money so that you can hire an attorney to protect yourself. And obviously, most of what we're dealing with here is in the context of a divorce proceeding, right? If it's just a SAPSER or just, you know, anything relating only to children, most these property issues are never going to come up. This is in the context of a divorce, okay? Um, so here you have withdrawing money from your 401k account, withdrawing money from a brokerage account, um, withdrawing or any manner surrendering or excuse me, withdrawing money for a life insurance policy, assuming that there is a cash value to that or entering any safe deposit box. And so obviously what the court is attempting to prevent here is um, from you guys, it's attempting to avoid the person who served with this going out and liquidating dating 401k accounts or brokerage accounts. Um, we want to make sure that all the assets remain there unless it's necessary for attorney's fees or reasonable living expenses. So Floyd, here we kind of start getting into life insurance policies and, and other insurance policies. Do you want to kind of speak on that? Right. And so same theory, right? Leave everything the way it is, right? So don't go changing your life insurance beneficiaries. Um, don't alter any um, health insurance, can't remove your spouse off health insurance, things like that. Um, if there's automobile insurance, not only do you have to continue it, but if it comes up for renewal during this interim period when the, after you've been served with this, you've got to renew that policy. So we've got to make sure that all the insurances stay the same, everybody's covered until we can get to a hearing. So 21, obviously, don't open um, or divert their mail. Um, if it's something that belongs to the petitioner, let's make sure that the petitioner gets it, okay? Um, this is a big one, and I've seen it happen, you know, several times on, in some of my divorce cases where um, the petitioner's name is signed on some sort of a check or a tax refund or something like that, and the respondent just takes off with the money. Obviously, if you were to receive a check, um, you know, during the interim while this TRO is in effect, then keep the check until we can make a reasonable conclusion as to who that money belongs to, right? Um, don't limit credit cards. Don't cut your spouse off if they have access to credit cards while this TRO is pending. That is something that and I guess perhaps we should have covered this at the onset, but when you are served with this TRO, Typically, this TRO will be in effect for no more than 14 days. Now, it can be extended. So if there's problems with service or with the, the hearing not being able to be conducted for various reasons, then it can be extended, right? And so eventually, you're going to get to what we call a temporary orders hearing. And when that happens, during that hearing, you can make specific requests, right? You can say, well, listen, you know, my wife has my credit card that she's been charging up um, thousands of dollars on, and I don't want my wife to have access to that credit card anymore. And it's at that point that the court can say, well, ma'am, hand over the credit card. Or 
you know, wife could come in and say, well, I know that he has our tax refund and I need that money to be cashed so that I can get access to it. And at that temporary hearing, the court can make that determination and decide who's going to get those funds. Um, so I can assure you there will be a remedy to whatever issue you may have, but you just have to be patient in the process. Okay. Um, so Floyd 24, um, discontinuing or reducing withholding for federal income taxes, um, you know, that's, that's obviously fairly easy and understandable. Um, financial records of the parties, emails, text messages, video messages. Do you want to speak on that? Yeah, so I guess I jumped ahead earlier when we were talking about electronic data um, with regard to text messages, emails, and um, social media. Um, so I already touched on that. You can't destroy or remove or alter any of that. Um, as far as the financial records, right, you can't... Um, you can't destroy bank statements. You can't, um, you know, cancel checks. Or if one party writes a check for something, you can't go in and ask it to be voided. Um, things like that. So you just you can't limit their access to the accounts, and you can't take them off of the uh, checking accounts or savings accounts. Um, you just have to leave everything the same. Okay. And here we have 28, which is kind of a big one. So deleting any data or contact from any social network profile. Okay. So, um, and I'm not a big Facebook user, um, but it's my understanding that there is a way to, um, what is it, Floyd? Make it inactive, right? Mm -hmm. okay. And so when you make it inactive, Facebook is still going to preserve all of your information, which is a, a huge thing that we want to make sure that we're doing. Um, you do not want to delete it, okay? Because if you delete it, um, then there's potential legal arguments that can be used against you to say, all right, well, you know, potentially the petitioner could come in and say, well, judge, I know that the respondent had all of these drug paraphernalia posts on their Facebook um, account, and um, but she's deleted it. Right, she's deleted that Facebook post. And so the court can presume that what the petitioner is saying is correct, number one. And you can also be held in contempt for deleting it after this, uh, you were served with this TRO. So make it inactive, preserve it. And if and when they request it, we may be compelled to turn that over. On that, Christina, um, I will say that generally speaking, if you've been served, the opposing party has probably looked at your Facebook and taken screenshots of whatever it is they wanted anyway. And so when you delete it, not only could you be in trouble with the court, but you could be facing potential criminal liability uh, for tampering with evidence. So that's felony. Good point. Um, so don't use passwords or PIN numbers to gain access to their bank accounts, social medias, electronic accounts. Again, this is something that, you know, I've seen quite a lot where, you know, you, typically when you're married, especially for an extended period of time, you're going to have access to all of their personal information. You're going to know their pins. You're going to know their passwords. Um, if you do that, you're in violation of this restraining order. So while I understand that some of that information may be very helpful to your case, grand scheme of things, we don't want you guys getting in trouble. And so there's ways and methods that we can do, we can get that information if you just give us the opportunity to do so. Um, 30 and 31, pretty simple. Don't terminate any of the um, utilities at the residence and don't exclude um, the other party from the residence, okay? There is a way to get someone kicked out of a home, but that's only under very special circumstances and that's far too expensive for us to discuss today. So when you are served with a TRO, the other side is still able to come into the residence and reside there. And neither one of you guys really should be terminating the utilities while you all are living there. 32, Floyd. Um, same thing, you can't prevent them from using the motor vehicles that you guys have used, pretty self-explanatory. All righty, so going to 33 through 37. Go ahead, Floyd. So these are the, the ones that protect the kids, right? Um, so you can't disturb the peace of the children. That's a very broad order. Um, 
but it just means, you know, don't, don't affect their normal daily routine, their normal daily life, right? Um, and then you can't withdraw them from school. This is to prevent the, you know, one person from going and picking up the children from school and taking them and hiding them, which also leads to 35. You can't hide the children from the other party. Um, and number 36, you can't talk badly about petitioner. Um, obviously, in front of the kids, obviously that's not good for the kids. And then 37, can't have overnight boyfriends and girlfriends while you have the kids. Um, obviously, also not good for the kids, particularly when their parents are being divorced. So those are to protect the kids, but that's what it says. And so this disturbing the peace of the child or of another party, that's the one that a lot of times will, um, like Floyd said, it's very general, which I think could potentially um, cause some some problems if you're served with this TRO. Um, so, you know, I've had clients say, well, I don't want my child to go to this baseball trip with dad anymore because, you know, he's filed against me. Um, I don't want um, him to be able to take him to school every single morning, even though he's done that for the past couple of years. Um, things like that. Your best bet is always just to, like Floyd said, maintain the status quo. And if and when those things become issues, when you go to a temporary hearing and you have the ability to present your evidence, the court's gonna take care of all of those issues. Um, and really, you don't wanna put your kids through that. There's enough drama going on um, in the first place. Um, and it really should just be as, as easy as you possibly can make it for them. Um, so, I'm not going to waste a whole lot of time going through the definition of personal property. I think it's pretty clear what it includes and what it does not include. Um, so here we have the relevant provision where it states this restraining order is effective immediately and shall continue in force and effect, full force and effect until further order of this court or until it expires by operation of law. It is binding on respondents, on respondents, agents, servants, and employees, and on those persons in active concert or participation with them who received actual notice of this order by personal service or otherwise. The requirement of a bond is waived. So with this paragraph, I always think it's kind of funny because I'll have, you know, some potential clients who are like, well, you know, is it okay if my dad goes in and, you know, closes this account? Or if my, you know, mom goes in and takes the car from my spouse? Um, no, it's not okay. Because what's going to end up happening is the court is going to impute that on you. Right. And even if they say, well, my son didn't tell me or my daughter didn't tell me, I had no idea this was going on. Safe bet is just don't do it. Right. Floyd? That is correct. So I'm going to let you deal with this fun stuff here. Thanks. So this is the portion that Christina was talking about earlier where it requires an affidavit. Um, for this purpose, it's what we call extraordinary relief. Um, and in this case, it looks like. We are we're doing a writ of attachment, which basically allows a constable to go pick up a child. Um, and then it also orders that um, that respondent in this case is not allowed to have any possession of or access to the kids. And so you have to do an affidavit um, to get this special request. Um, and it has to has to show the court how the children will suffer significant impairment um, if the court does not enter this emergency order. Um, and so once this is signed, there's going to be a writ of attachment also issued since it was requested here. Constable is going to go pick up the kids and then the respondent in this case will not be allowed to have any access to the kids until they go to court. And so I will say that typically when the court is inclined to grant this sort of relief is because there's something that's really bad that's going on, right? So we have some family violence, we have some drugs, we have some um, somebody who's taken off with the kids across state lines or has hidden the kids for several months and we don't know what's what's going on with the children. Those are type, the types of things that the petitioner would have had to allege to get to these types of orders, 
Now, as Floyd stated, a sheriff or a constable will have the ability to go and pick up the children, okay? Obviously, that is not the court's first choice. That is not our first choice. And so if ever you are served with any sort of a TRO um, like this, and perhaps you don't receive it by notice of a constable or a sheriff, which could sometimes happen, right? Where you just find out about this before actually being served by them. Your best bet is always going to be to obviously contact an attorney, but you really should comply because we don't want, we've had situations where people have failed to comply even when they knew that this stuff was going on and it just got really, really bad and really ugly. Um, and so the best bet is just with this entire order, just follow it when you're served with it and hire a really exceptional attorney to help you navigate through it if and when you get to a temporary hearing, okay? Um, now here, um, it says that there's gonna be a hearing, right? You have to show up for the hearing. And one of the biggest things is, is that the TRO, this is what we're requesting, right? Or what the court is going to determine. Um, and so one of the things is, is the TRO, if it should be made a temporary injunction pending the final hearing. And so basically what that means is, is that this order can stay in place until your case is finalized. All of those 32 things, 32, 37 things that we mentioned could be um, in place throughout the pendency of the suit, uh, which is really for everybody's protection, right? And normally what happens is that becomes joint and mutual, um, and both of you guys are going to have to be ordered to comply with it. And it's for everyone's protection so we can preserve assets and we don't have people threatening and harassing and running off with kids. Um, so more than likely in most cases that will take place. And then the rest of this is the other request that petitioner in this case would be making. So conservatorship, visitation, things of that nature. So Floyd, any other questions, concerns, anything else that we need to cover when it comes to TROs? So just a couple things I wanna put out, point out here. One, if you noticed everything said that respondent is prevented from, respondent is excluded from, right? Um, this one was, was requested by the petitioner and served on respondent. And so it's not binding on the petitioner, right? The petitioner is allowed to do, well, not prevented from doing all of those things. Only respondent is prevented from doing all of those things. So the way to stop petitioner from doing all those things is to hire an attorney, go in and request your own TRO, have them serve with that. And then both of you are, are ordered not to do all of those things. Um, so if you get served on one of these, you get served with one of these, hire an attorney quickly. That way you can get the same injunctions against the petitioner and make sure they're not withdrawing money and things like that. Um, Let and, me interject okay. really quickly though, because on that, I typically will tell my clients when we're serving this, like, don't be a jerk and you need to make sure that you're complying with this too, because even though our clients can't be held in contempt of court for doing this. I don't know that it, it will not sit well with the judge if you're doing these things. That's correct. Um, and so basically, I mean, in summation, the, the TRO, I mean, if, if you're not rude to the other party, if you're not shady with the property and you protect the kids, you're going to be fine. Did you just say in summation? Yes. Is that a word? <laughs> it is a word, but we're not in court. But we're summarizing, right? Well, it is a summation, yes. So yes, I did say in summation. Very good. Well, in summation, if you're ever served with the TRO, then reach out to a good family law attorney. That way they can advise you on the do's and don'ts and make sure that you're in full compliance. Um, and again, you'll have an opportunity to get everything straightened out once you get into court.